Psalms this morning. Actually, Psalm 113. Uh, I was looking for a text this morning. Uh, we've been in the Gospel of John and Colossians quite a bit, but I was looking for something sort of to take a break from that, that study and, and step out for a moment. And this Psalm uh, jumped out at me. Uh, so this is Psalm 113. It's actually part of an important uh, group of Psalms, Psalm 113 to 118, which are used uh, by the Jewish people every year to celebrate the Passover. These are called the Egyptian Hallel. They are the five Psalms that are sung as part of the Passover meal. This is the first one. The first two are sung before you take the meal, and the last four, excuse me, there's six of them, are sung afterwards. So this is one of the psalms that Jesus would have led when the gospel tells us that he led him before they went out to the Mount of Olives. So at the Last Supper, this is the first psalm that they would have sung or, or whatever it was that they did in terms of chanting or song or what, however they put it together. This is the first one. So we're going to take a look at it this morning and see what the text has for us to learn. Beginning with the first three verses. Let me read the first three verses and then we'll go back and comment on them. It says, Praise the Lord. Praise the servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. We begin with praise the Lord, which is in Hebrew, Two words, hallelujah and yah. And you might have heard that before. We uh, changed the spelling around a little bit there. Uh, use it often in our, our Christmas and our, our Easter songs. We use it quite a bit. I don't know how many people know that that actually is what that is. Yah would be the first part of the name of God, would it not? Yahweh, which is Lord. So it is praise the Lord in Hebrew. What does it mean to praise something? We say that sometimes, or praise someone. What does it actually mean when you praise someone? Well, there are two real ways that people praise. The first one, the most common one, is to talk about what's positive about it, to, to list positive attributes uh, that are worth being recognized. You know, uh, when you talk about Superman, you know, he's faster than a locomotive, able to leap tall buildings in a single bound, uh, all that kind of stuff, right? You talk about it. The different great things about them. You list what's good about them. Another way that you can praise is to make a comparison that shows why this is better than that, why this thing is better than that thing, or this person is better than that person. You compare. Well, this psalm does both. It lists primarily one. It focuses on one of God's praiseworthy attributes and qualities, and then asks the rhetorical question, who is like the Lord? Who else is like this? So we are going to take a look at that, but it remains the question, how do you praise the Lord? It tells us to praise the Lord, and it says praise the Lord, but how do you do it? Well, you can do it in song. That's probably the most common one. You can do it with a speech. You can do it in the written word. You can write something. Uh, you can do it in poetry. Uh, the psalmist is certainly doing both, both, both poems here and psalms. You can do it in prayer. You can do it in music. You can even praise the Lord in dance. I know, it's true though. You can, you can praise the Lord with dance. I am not going to try to do so, and I never will, uh, because you wouldn't want to see it. But you can do it. You can praise the Lord in your service. You can praise the Lord in your offerings, of your time, of your money, of your effort. There are as many ways of praising the Lord uh, as you can imagine. We aren't restricted. We are not told, praise the Lord this way and that way and only that way. We're not told that. We're given choice. Because God desires praise from us in whichever way our talents or our inclinations lead us. Are you big into music? Then praise the Lord in song. Uh, are, do you appreciate writing? Like, whatever your thing is that you are good at, that you enjoy, praise the Lord that way. Even sometimes praise the Lord in the ways you're not good at. Maybe you hate singing. Maybe you think your voice is horrible and you can't carry a tune. Who cares? Praise the Lord that way anyway. 
The verse also talked, these first three verses also talk about, uh, O oh, servants of the Lord, praise the name. The servants, praise the name. Yeah, and we have a little bit of a hard time with that as Americans. That seems a little bit odd for us, talking about masters and servants and slaves. We've got history with, with that issue in our country, certainly, and it, it's weird. We certainly don't consider ourselves to be anyone's servant, do we? We walk around thinking of ourselves as anyone's servant. In America, those are more like fighting words than anyone else, than anything else, because we don't bow before anyone, right? What was that, one of those first flags that was considered said, don't tread on me, the snake. And saying, don't mess with us, we're not going to put up with anybody. That's our attitude as Americans. But we must ask ourselves, does our pride prevent us from understanding and respecting that God is indeed Lord? God's Lordship. You see, God deserves that amount of respect from us, whether or not it is difficult for us to give it. We might be more comfortable, perhaps, with understanding a husband praising his wife, or a mother praising her child. We're used to that sort of thing. Or maybe even a friend saying, man, this friend of mine is just, is just so, you know, he's there for me, he's awesome, he's, he's a great friend. We're used to that. But a servant praising a master is a little bit out of our, our area of comfort. If a servant is going to go ahead and praise a master, though, he must have some master. So let's take a look. You see, in the ancient world, masters and servants were common. Everybody understood the relationship between a master and a slave, or a master and a servant. It was a common relationship. You obeyed a master. You respected them sometimes. But praise them? That's a bit of a stretch. You certainly, the Lord, must be some master indeed, if the psalmist is going to say, praise the Lord, O you servants of the Lord. He also says, praise the name of the Lord. And that's a very specific thing. And with respect to Shakespeare, I'd like to say, what is in a name? Would the Lord, by any other name, be the same? Well, the name, the name of the Lord in the Old Testament is very important. When you see L-O-R-E capitalized in your text, most translations use it that way, that is telling you that in the Hebrew, that is Yahweh. That is the name, literally, of the Lord. It is the name that God gave Moses in Exodus 3.14 when he said, I am who I am. If the people ask, tell them I am sent you. Another way of uh, understanding that translation is, I am the one who is. It's a very difficult thing to put into English uh, because of the way our grammar works. But that is what the name of the Lord is. It is God's name and God's name matters. He chose to reveal himself to Moses as Yahweh. When Moses said, who should I say is, is calling, basically, to the people of Israel, that is the name he was given. So what is the distinction? What is the purpose of God's name when we say, praise the name of the Lord? Well, God reveals himself to us. We didn't imagine these attributes of God. This is not the fictional God that we have made up and said, you know, we would like God who is merciful, and we would like God who loves us. That's not what we did. This is who God is. We know it's true because God has revealed himself and demonstrated these qualities, these attributes, to us. So what is the scope of praising to God? How, how much praise? What kind of praise? Verse 3 talks about now and forevermore. You see, there is no reason to stop praising God because God doesn't change. What was praiseworthy about God today will be praiseworthy about God tomorrow. What David and Abraham and Moses and others thought, thought were worthy attributes of God to be praised are still there today. <clears throat> Nor has the goodness of God waned over time over years as time has gone by. We still rely, rely excuse me, upon the Lord. We still call upon the name of the Lord, and He still answers us in our prayers and in our petitions. The psalm also says, from the rising of the sun to the place where it sets. You see, there is no place where God doesn't deserve praise. God is not just the God of Israel. They are certainly his covenant people, but God's goodness extends over all the earth. That was something that wasn't entirely understood by God's people. And it wasn't entirely understood until Paul took the 
gospel to the Gentiles and began preaching Christ to all the nations. There was resistance to that because they didn't understand that God was the God of all the earth. Not, not really, not how deep they did. But now we can just assume that. It's a matter of course. We take it for granted, I think, that, that God has universal appeal. That the gospel is for all nations. Because we are the recipients of countless missionaries who have gone to the ends of the earth and have shared the gospel with peoples that have never heard it before. Verse 4, let's take a look at verse 4. It says, the Lord is exalted over all the nations, his glory above the heavens. The Lord is exalted. This answers the question, how much praise is God supposed to get? God is supposed to be praised all over the earth forever. How much? Well, here's two different examples. God has authority over all the nations. That's not something they tend to admit, is it? Not a lot of nations out there are saying, you know what, God's in control here. No, we're just doing God's will. You don't often hear that uh, from politicians, do you? Not last I checked. Uh, even our own nation, where we say in our pledge of allegiance, one nation under God. Even our nation chases but the notion that it is God's will that we're supposed to be doing. Unless, it, of course, we decide that, you know what, God's will is America's will. It's an amazing thing how that lines up perfectly, that God is for America, and only for America, and always for America. It, when God's will is that, we've got no problem with God being in control, because it works out just perfectly for us. But God reigns over all the nations, ours included, every nation of the earth. God's glory is above the heavens. Now this is an interesting concept. Have you ever thought about this? It isn't control of heaven that makes the Lord God. God is not God because he is in heaven. Heaven is heavenly because God's presence is there. Do you ever think about it that way? It's not something special about heaven that makes it why we want to go there when we die. We want to go to heaven when we die because that is where God is. God's presence makes heaven a place worth visiting and staying for a while. How much praise? God deserves praise and glory over all the nations, above the heavens. And then verses 5 and 6. This is the interesting part of the psalm, the part of the psalm that, that we're going to chew on the most here today. Let's look at verses 5 and 6. Who is like the Lord our God, the one who sits enthroned on high, who stoops, down to look on the heavens and the earth. There is an interesting concept, beginning with the phrase, who is like the Lord our God? Short answer, no one. There isn't anybody like the Lord our God. You see, there are many ways to express how and why the Lord is different from the gods that were worshipped by various faith nations and various people. We can talk about a lot of things that are distinctives about God. Why is God different? How is God unique? But this quality stands out, I think, the most. God is willing to stoop down to help us. Where else are you going to find that? Not something the Greek gods were find them doing. Not something the Egyptian gods ever did. Not something the gods of the Babylonians would ever possibly do. Not something Allah would do. Certain. Stoop down and help his people. It makes you think. You know, if you are going to condescend, if you are going to come down and help someone, you must have first ascended. You must be up high if you are going to come down low. <coughs> Excuse me for a moment. <clears throat> the reason why God's care and concern for us is so remarkable is because of how high and lofty his position enthroned on high is to begin with. God is so unique because he came down so far. Consider the holiness of God. Consider that he can't even be approached by a sinful man lest we die. Remember your Old Testament covenant. The high priest on one day could enter the Holy of Holies and only with blood if he did it any other day, he'd be struck dead. They had to tie a rope around his leg just in case he did do something silly like that. They could pull him back out. 
That was how serious the holiness of God is. Consider the glory of God. He can't even be approached by a mortal man, lest he die. Moses' face, we looked at that scripture this morning, Moses' face glowed from seeing a glimpse of God's back. God says, yeah, you can't really look at my face, Moses. I'm going to put my hand over you, and when I go by, I'll let you get a, get a little glimpse of me after I've already gone by. And even that was enough to make his face glow. Now that seems kind of odd, The people were scared to death of Moses after that. They said, put a veil over your face, Moses. We were scared of even the reflection of God's glory in your face. So imagine the height of God. And yet God chooses to stoop to our level. Now, that phrase has a bad connotation to it, doesn't it? When you talk about someone stooping to their level, that means you're getting down on their level and, and lowering yourself, doesn't it? When we use it in English. But that is not at all what we're talking about here. What God is doing is not a bad thing at all. It's a good thing. Not only is it a good thing, it is the basis of our only hope of salvation, that God is willing to stoop to our level. The example of Jesus explains it most clearly. We read Philippians 2, 5 through 11. In that, we are reminded in that famous passage that Jesus was and is God, and yet chose to become a man. Not only a man, but a servant. A servant who would be willing to be obedient to God's will. Why on earth to save us from our sins? That whole passage encapsulates that. That is the uniqueness of Jesus Christ. Where else are you going to find God at our level? God with us. You are not going to find that anywhere else. Without certainly being sullied by our world. So that we can be raised to God's level. This is an amazing thing. Now we don't have any claim of obligation on God in this area. It was God's choice as creator to not stand apart from us. Do not stand back from his creation and say, eh, they screwed up, let them get what they deserve. God, rather than that, sent his son into the world. Sent his son into the created world to become a part of it, that he might redeem both this world, literally this world, and the people in it. So how far does God have to bend as it were, to get down to us. Consider that his holy perfection came into sinful rebellion and walked among us. That his infinite immortality became finite and mortal. It was more of a gap to bridge than the loftiest of kings. Think of the greatest of kings, you know, Louis XIV or, or Solomon in his splendor. One of these kings that you imagine with all their pomp and circumstance and regality. Now imagine that king sitting down in the gutter next to the lowliest of beggars. You've not yet imagined the gap between God and us. And yet God is willing to stoop and bridge it. Not only that, verses 17, 7 and 9 give us something even perhaps more remarkable and more unexpected. Look at that. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes, with the princes of their people. He settles the barren woman in her home as a happy mother of children. Praise the Lord. Not only that, but God has a preference. God's preference is for the poor and the needy. This is one of the consonant themes throughout Scripture. Turn anywhere in Scripture, the Gospels, to the Old Testament, to the Epistles, and you will find God showing a marked preference for the side of the poor and the oppressed and the needy. Imagine that. But this is in keeping with God's willingness to stoop to us. It is the inverse of that. Not only does God come up from on high down to us, but he is also willing to elevate the humble up. He's doing both things. He's coming down to us, and he's bringing the humble, the poor, the weak, the needy, up. Let me share just the, the examples that popped into my mind off the top of my head. Remember the story of Joseph. He was the lowest of slaves, sold into slavery by his own brothers, and God raises him up to leadership and control of Egypt. 
the most, most powerful nation in the world at the time. Think of Moses. Moses started off life in a basket floating down the river. And yet at the end of it, God said, this man is my friend. Imagine David sitting out there hanging out in the sheep. Glorious job that is. And yet God raised him up and sat him on the throne and said, this man is a man after my own heart. Think about those disciples that God chose. Half of them were fishermen. Fishermen is not a glorious job. It certainly wasn't back then and it's not now. It's hard work. It's dirty work. And yet God said, I like these guys. Jesus said, I can use these men. I can use a tax collector too. I can bring these people and make them my disciples. You see, God was the first one to appreciate the underdog story. The underdog stories that we love in our politics, right? We love when someone comes out of nowhere and upsets the system and, and wins it all. Or in our sports, we love the group against the Yankees, don't we? Right? I mean, geez, not them. Anybody but, but them. Or in every sport, we love it when the team knocks them off, the Cinderella. Or in our movies, we love those movies about someone coming from nowhere, Rocky, right? Coming off the mean streets and being the champion. Well, God was the one that appreciated that story first. He's always been about the business of raising up the downtrodden. But why the poor? Why is he picking on the poor? Why is he letting the poor get off? Isn't it their own fault we think? Aren't they the ones that chose drugs and alcoholism? They made bad choices and didn't get an education and it's their own bad luck, right? We start to feel that way sometimes about the poor. Yet God consistently sides with the poor against the rich and with the weak against the strong. Consistently. Beginning to think that God must see something in them that we don't. You see, this wasn't the way that life was supposed to be. When God created this world, it was supposed to be without distinctions. And yet, sin exists in our world, and because of it, we have scarcity and a competition that leads inevitably to haves and have-nots. This is not the way it was supposed to be. But there is a value in the poor in the will of God. And this is something that we need to understand. This is a crucial point in Scripture. The poor aren't full of themselves. You haven't considered that. They are not full of themselves. They're more likely to listen to God. Who listened to Jesus when he marched around preaching the good news? Not the rich, the poor. The rich man walked away sad. The poor man said, I got this guy. This guy's message is for me. The weak don't trust their own strength and are more likely to rely upon God. Who had faith that Jesus could heal them? The blind, the lame, the cripples. Because they had no strength of their own. And lastly, in our text, we have an interesting topic, the barren woman. Scripture has a large number of stories about God blessing barren women. So much so that we could look at it as a pattern or call it a theme of Scripture. Think of these four. Sarah, that was her name before she became Sarah, when she had Isaac, whose name means laughter, because she laughed at the idea of having him in her old age. But she became the mother of the child of promise. God gave her a child. Think about Rachel. Rachel was loved by her husband Jacob. She was desperate. She was so desperate, she said, if I don't have a kid, I'm going to die. She was so upset. She was finally vindicated by the birth of Joseph. Think about Hannah. She doesn't get quite as much recognition. Hannah promised to give a son to God. She was so desperate to have a son that she said, I don't want to keep him. Just let me have one, Lord, and I'll give him back to you. Samuel served God his whole life in the, in the tabernacle. Interestingly enough, Verses 7 and 8 of our scripture this morning, verses 7 and 8 of this psalm are not original. They are the prayer of Hannah. If you turn uh, to 1 Samuel chapter 2 and read Hannah's prayer, you're going to see those exact verses, verses 7 and 8. That's Hannah speaking about God raising up the desperate. She knew exactly what she was talking about. By the way, after that, she had three more sons and two daughters. So she still had a full household, even though Samuel uh, went to live in the tabernacle. 
And then lastly, Elizabeth. Don't forget about Elizabeth. She was long past those childbearing years when she had John the Baptist at the same time that her younger relative had that uh, Jesus kid going on. So God certainly works in his will with barren women. Think about those four men. Isaac, Joseph, Samuel, and John the Baptist, all brought about through women that people had given up on. And God says, don't you give up. I'm still at work here. Clearly, God enjoys the delight of the mother whose prayer he answers with a long way to child. And then lastly, we end with the second half of verse 9, reiterating the phrase, praise the Lord. And for whatever reason, it struck me that this would be a great time to list what you always tell kids when they're trying to write an article. Who needs to be praised? The Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Father of Jesus Christ, Yahweh, I am who I am. He is the one who is to be praised. What does he need? He needs praise. We need to lift up the name of the Lord and remember his acts of love and mercy and grace. When? When do we praise the Lord? Always. Morning, noon, or night, it doesn't matter. Whenever your heart feels thankful to the Lord, lift up his name and praise. Where do we praise the Lord? Everywhere. At church, certainly, but in our home, in our car, at work, wherever. Take a walk, wherever you find yourself. Why do we praise the Lord? Because God is good. He's good to you and he's good to me. He has given us grace and mercy and peace and love. And how do we praise the Lord? It doesn't matter how as long as, as it is joyful. The scripture says make a joyful noise. So go ahead and make a joy, joyful noise to the Lord any which way you can.